Amen. Thank you, children. Nice percussion. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you to the Holy Spirit, kite flyers and flame bearers. Sierra, who was confirmed yesterday at Grace Cathedral, along with others that we'll recognize in prayer later. It's not surprising that today's readings on this Pentecost Sunday are inspiring. In the collect on page 5, which we read to collect the theme of the day, we're told that on this day, God, quote, taught the hearts, taught the hearts of faithful people. Think about that. Taught the hearts. And that now as we pray this prayer to begin the service, in doing so ourselves, we must be learning with our hearts. We seek to, quote, have right judgment in all things. And when we have right judgment in all things, that leads to rejoicing in the good, giving thanks that we're participating in the good. Isn't that what spiritual legacy is about, participating and so promoting good things? What is religion for if not for that? In today's gospel reading, Read in the midst of the children, Jesus is saying that we will be comforted by an advocate, an advocate, someone who is for us, someone who is with us, someone who wants us to succeed, an advocate from God, a spirit of truth that Jesus says abides, abides in those who are faithful followers, abides, dwells, lives, moves, inspires us. God is with us as Jesus was inspired. Not only to know love, not only to know mercy, not only to know good things, good gifts, good human traits, but to act likewise. You will know these things by doing these things, Jesus says. And then we have the book of Acts, which we began, that first reading that Paul read, where the Holy Spirit appears, where the church is trying to figure out who they are and what they're doing and and how they're going to do it. 50 days, Penta, 50 days after the resurrection. They're still trying to figure it out. But something powerful and mysterious happens. Something holy happens. The Holy Spirit, a Holy Spirit, an experience defined by a response to an acute awareness of God's presence happens, tongues of fire and holy speaking, a bewildering occurrence happens, a glimpse perhaps of a godly vision or that beloved community that we talk about, that we pray about, that we hope for. People speak and hear in a way that transcends difference. What is foreign is no longer a dark mystery. What is highlighted is what is held in common. Notice, friends, God doesn't create a common universal language that everyone speaks, like the Latin we struggled through in school. Rather, the same spirit is heard through many languages simultaneously. Both diversity and difference are retained. Commonality, understanding, in spite of differences, lifted up. Different ethnicities are retained, and a common shared message of a power beyond the differences in God's powerful presence is experienced. Quote, deeds of power are understood and serve to unite the various ethnicities and all their variety. Think about that. That's Pentecost. As Peter clarifies, this is not drunken confusion because it is so strange and so rare. But something new, this is not ignorant naivete, but something new. Hearts learning that God inspires new visions and new dreams for young and old alike, free and slave, men and women, 
and that this vision will lift all past dark portents. In other words, will bring us to healing, will bring us to salvation, will bring us to redemption. It's all possible. It's palpable on that day, and it's powerful. A spirit of truth can truly overcome division. That is the dream. That is the vision of God. So what does this mean to us? We weren't there. We weren't there that day. And yet to be believers in God and Christ and the Holy Spirit of God is to trust something that is sorely lacking in our culture today. To trust. Trust in the ongoing presence of God's Spirit. Even in the midst of challenge. Especially in the midst of challenge. Because God is both good and powerful. That that presence is with us now and in us now and changes us should we desire to receive it. As Jesus says in the gospel, you can't receive the spirit of truth if you don't see it or if you don't know it. But we do see it. We do know it. We know it when we see kindness, when we see compassion, when we see people helping each other. We know it when our hearts ache because of suffering, because other people hurting other people, because they're afraid, because they're demonizing the other, because they're interested in their own self-centered needs only. We know it. We do see good and Pentecost is about reclaiming the vision. It's about reliving the dream, if only to prove to ourselves that it is not in vain to hope and to live and embody spiritual gifts. Listen to the Apostle Paul as he writes to the people of Colossae. But now put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. This is the early church struggling. Seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there cannot be Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as Christ's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, forbearing one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. And sing hymns and psalms and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's a letter written to a Christian community. Just like ours. A letter that we need to hear. That we need to remember. To reclaim the vision and the dream. We have to figure out how to live, how to interpret scripture, how to be Christians in this challenging world. In fact, in the very next verse of this letter, Paul writes, wives be subject to your husbands. We've rethought that, haven't we? <laughs> I have not read that at a wedding ceremony recently. It's still suggested in the old book. I didn't read it at Zareen's wedding last weekend, this beautiful gathering of young people professing love. But we sure talked about love. We talked about forgiveness. 
We, put, we talked about the reality of relationships, that we have to give to each other the love that we receive, that we have to give up a part of ourselves. If we learn anything from Jesus, it's that love is sacrificial, ultimately. And when we fail to do that, we have to forgive. That's my wedding homily. Give, give up, and forgive. Right? Give, give up, and forgive. Because we need to keep going. Our hearts keep learning. And I believe truly it's about the heart. It's not about who is intellectually right. Thinking you are right and saying so is not necessarily compassionate, even if you're right. Not necessarily meek or patient. Right? Am I right about being wrong? <laughs> and that's why gracefulness and forgiveness are the last values of the parish theme. You have that card in your bulletin about the parish theme. Right? Rooted and rising. We're rooted in Christ and rising in Christ. So we're rooted in that inspiration. It starts with inspiration. Stability, integrity, the necessities, the details of our lives reflect our faith. But we, we end that with gracefulness and forgiveness so that we can begin again. We know that we need that. And that's the spirit of Pentecost as well. Breathing through us. Breathing through us. Because that's what inspiration means, literally. Breath. Inspire. And so we remember that. We remember the hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. 19th century text. Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. We should remember that every morning when we go wake up, that when we breathe, God is with us. That when we breathe, the Spirit is with us. That we are not alone. That we are empowered by the presence of God. We need to slow down sometimes when we're tired, when we're fatigued, when we're dejected, when we're despairing, when we're angry, and breathe in the breath of God and ask, what should I do now? This week, my seven-year-old granddaughter, Maddox, many of you know her, first grade, she said to me, Papa, did you know that when a frog burmates, his heart stops beating? So I corrected her. I said, it's actually hibernation, and I'm not sure the heart can stop. She was right on both accounts, <laughs> right? Number one, when a cold-blooded animal hibernates, it's called burmation. Did you know this? And two, some frogs' hearts do stop and they, they breathe through their skin in the cold in the winter when they're burmating in order to survive. So I guess this is why the Greeks say seven is the age of reason. <laughs> but I hope you have a way to fortify yourself when you feel like your heart stops. And remember that your heart is learning anew how to be alive, how to be warm, how to be loving. We need to practice and remind ourselves that we breathe in the breath of God and that God is with us. Maddox told me on the same day, she said she had cried early in the day. I said, what did you cry about? She said, there was this massive march of ants coming through the kitchen to the garbage pail. I said, oh, I know. That's, I hate that. But why did you cry? I was scared. I said, when you're scared, stop and take a breath. And remember who you are and that you're bigger than ants. <laughs> my, my little point is this, that if we stop and remember who we are and we breathe in and know that God is present, that we are changed, that we are empowered, that we are a different people, and that what we do from that moment on matters and will change everything around us. We are sacramental when we remember that we are outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual grace. Pentecost is remembering that nothing separates us from the love of God. Nothing. And there is power, great power, in believing that that is true. That the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit is within us every time we breathe, and, and we are learning, our hearts are learning. I believe in progress. 
I believe that we become more and more loving through prayer, through study, through surrender to the power of God. We become stronger. And we can change ourselves and we can change the people around us and we can be a presence of the Spirit ourselves. I believe that's true. And I know you do too. So let us make it so as we live and move and breathe and have our being in the Spirit of God. Amen.